Okay, guys. Okay, today I'm going to be talking to you guys about um, the place where we're going to be going, English term. And we'll be talking about its for the composition of its force and its kind of its significance in post-Katrina New Orleans. Here's beautiful Louisiana. That's where New Orleans is right there. This is Shreveport. That's where my wife Charlotte is from. <laughs> She's very nice. Let's us go on trips. <laughs> that little elbow there is English Turn. Uh, here's New Orleans with Pont Lake Pontchartrain to the north and Lake uh, Bourne to the east, that ghostly body of water. Um, you can see the river snaking through the city and then heading southeast toward the Bird's Foot Delta and the Gulf of Mes Mexico, which is off to the lower right. Um, that big curve is English Turn. English Turn has some very nice large fragments of bottomland hardwood forest. That's the characteristic forest in the New Orleans area and in uh, uh, the Mississippi floodplain and along the Gulf Coast states. Uh, but less than 20% of these forests are still intact. How much? Less than 20%. Less than 20%? You guys should write that down somewhere. Are still intact. And um, examples of old growth bottomland hardwood forests are very rare. The forests in New, in New Orleans, in the New Orleans area, area, are largely gone and are continuing to disappear. For example, um, I shot this in August 2015. It's almost a square kilometer of forest cleared for development. That's definitely not a good thing for New Orleans, as you may expect. Uh, these forests provide New Orleans with a number of ecosystem for services, one of which is the ability to buffer the city from the effects of hurricanes, uh, both winds and surge. And as you likely know, sea level and the frequency of hurricanes are projected to rise significantly this, this century. Here's John Lambrinos. Have these guys met John yet? Not yet. Well, Soon. Well, this is uh, John uh, in an English turn forest after a rain. Uh, he's standing in about two feet of water. Uh, and, and that's the beauty of these forests. They behave like sponges that soak up flood waters that would normally flow into canals and populated areas. Aren't you talking about trash bag technology? Oh, uh, I really should. <laughs> This is a great approach to, um, to uh, having uh, to a raincoat, alternative to raincoats. Because raincoats, you guys are going to have many a tangle with the uh, blackberry, with the rubus. And um, it will rip <laughs> stuff apart. But these trash bags, well, they can rip apart and you just put a new one on. <laughs> Uh, when it rains in New Orleans, which it does a lot, these forests hold that rainwater and slowly release it over the course of days, which reduces the intensity of flooding. These are CSUCI students marking forest quadrats in the flooded forest. If it doesn't rain, this forest would be dry in three or four days. Uh, these forests don't just contribute to flood protection, they're beautiful places that support wildlife, including tens of thousands of migrating birds, like this hooded warbler, the landed, branded, uh, banded at Delacro. But despite their beauty and diversity, and the worsening situation vis-a-vis -vis rising sea level and increased hurricane, hurricane frequency, bottom line hardwood forests are still being cleared. This is a paper published in 2002 by White and Skojak. In it, they do floristic surveys of seven of the most intact, pristine hardwood forest fragments left in the New Orleans area. 
Here's a better picture of the map. The letters correspond to each forest. A is Airline, Hermit, Jackson, Lafitte, Oak, Sauvage, and Vera. Uh, there's English Turn right there. Now, English Turn was not included in this paper for reasons that I'll talk about in a bit. And you, but here's the sad part. Between the time White and Skojak wrote the paper, had it reviewed, and published it, <coughs> two of the forests, Airline and Verrett, had already been cut and cleared for development. And it looks like Sauvage was more or less destroyed by Hurricane Katrina. Here's how it happened. Uh, this is Bio Sauvage National Wildlife Refuge on August 16, 2005. 13 days before Hurricane Katrina made landfall on the 29th. I'm going to zoom into that little yellow box. Those are tree canopies that are more or less continuous. This is Bio Sauvage on September 7th, eight days after the storm. The whole forest is underwater. And it turns out it's salty water from a huge canal called the Mississippi River Gulf Outlet, Mr. Go for short. Here's a closer view. Uh, that, that's water completely covering the forest. Those white marks, are, those white marks are, are waves. This salty water was trapped for four weeks by man-made levees surrounding the refuge. So they built these, ref these levees mm -hmm. to protect the refuge but once it was inundated with salt water, they couldn't get the water out. And this is Biosavage five months later in February 2006. Here's a closer view. The forest is completely trashed. Those are trees, completely denuded of leaves, lying down, you know, flat on the ground. Matchsticks. And this is 2014, nine years later. You can see the huge brown spot. The forest is still trashed because of that salt water flooding from Katrina. Now, English turf fared better. There were many large trees left standing, and there doesn't appear to have been any salt water flooding. Vegetation <coughs> grew back quickly and continues to recover. But the forest has been heavily impacted by development. Here's the golf course. Uh, this is a small community there. This is like suburban encroachment. This is where Katie lives. Uh, I'd say over 50% of the English turn forest has been developed or degraded. Now, the good news is that, you know, that means that 50% of the forest is still more, more or less intact in these three big patches. And they're almost continuous, which has some important biological significance for animal dispersal, as you know, for sure. So together, um, they're a relatively big chunk of forest and a good target for conservation efforts. In fact, two large pastures are currently being managed by KD as reserves. Uh, they are Woodlands Trail and Delacro. And this is where you guys are going to be working. In 2014, we set up some, pl some plots in Delacro, and that's what the data that I'm going to be showing you now. Here's a closer view of Delacro. And this is the location of eight 20 by 20 meter plots we surveyed a few years back. This is a list of tree species from woodlands in Delacro, for which we have collected herbarium specimens. We collected 30 species in 22 genera, and 17 families. Uh, this is data from the eight plots we did at Delta. These are in order of abundance, essentially density. Trying to characterize a forest using abundance or density can be misleading because a lot of small individuals can look important, more important than a few really big individuals that are more dominant in terms of mass or volume. So forester, foresters have come up with another measure called importance value. Do you guys get that? Say again, say again. Do you guys, well, the fact that 
measuring something in terms of de density or abundance, the number of something, can be misleading because a lot of small things can look really big. And one or two gigantic trees can look very small, like a small component of the community. So foresters have come up with this measure called importance value. A species importance value is a combination of a, spe a species' relative density plus its relative basal area. The basal area is just the cross-sectional area of a tree at breast height. These are importance values from Delacroix on the left, and then to the right, White and Skojak's forests. The last column contains the means from all the White and Skojak forests. It doesn't include Delacroix. The bold numbers are the top three species in each forest. Delacroix differs from these other forests in some significant ways. The top two species in the White and Skojak forests were Quercus virginiana and Celtis levigata. You guys know those. These species <laughs> aren't even present in our plots of Delacro. So the most abundant, the top two species in White and Skojak were not even present in our plots of Delacro, which is kind of surprising. So, so just to be clear, they're at our site but they're not in our representative plots. Acer rubrum, red maple, is the dominant species in our plots of Delacro, but it's fifth in the white and skojack forests. Our second dom dominant, Taxodium disticum, bald cypress, is a tiny component of the white and skojack forests. And bald cypress is a really big, majestic tree that's very important culturally and economically. You can't miss it. Um, and cypress is a gymnosperm. It's the only conifer in our forest. All the other trees are angiosperms, flowering trees. And our third dominant delicro, Fraximus, the ashes, is generally a marginal component of white and skojack forest. So it really looks like delicro is very different floristically from the seven forests that White and Skojak surveyed. And I think the reason has to do with the history of land use and hydrological modification in the English Term Peninsula. These are the English Term Forests today. Uh, it's bottomland hardwood forest uh, with a more or less closed canopy between 25 and 40 meters high. But it wasn't always like that. This is a map of English turn published in 1803. It's hanging on the wall of the museum in the French Quarter called the Historic New Orleans Collection. Which we will go to. What this map shows is the original vegetation of English turn was stratified with, with forests along the Mississippi River that were partially cleared and, in and an interior which is labeled prairie, which was likely a wetland dominated by grasses, a marsh, something like like this, a marsh about eight miles east of English Turn. This is the kind of vegetation created by natural levees. Have you guys discussed levees? Not yet, way? not yet. All right. Levees are ridges along riverbanks. They can occur naturally, or they can be built to contain a river or a canal during flood stage. This is Steve Nelson explaining how the levee in back of that house broke during Katrina. It's an artificial levee with a concrete flood wall on top. So, so go back for one second. So just to be clear, so this is in New Orleans. It's on our levee failure tour. And we're looking, there's a house, the backyard of the house, instead of going out really far, it goes to the toe of the levee, right? The dirt part, that's what the levee is. And then there's what's called a flood wall, which is the concrete extra height. So if we were to just jump over that wall, we'd be in a canal. We'd be in a drainage canal. So we'd be in a creek that is trying to let the water gravitationally flow out of this part of the town. And so that's, that's what we're staring at. And this is an artificial, this is also an artificial levee built to contain the Donner Canal that drains English Turn today. 
levees can also form naturally. This is how, how it happens. This is the initial condition, a river within its banks at low seasonal water levels. So there's not a lot of water. Left. This is most of the years like that. Most of them, yeah. Here's the river at flood stage. At flood stage, the heaviest, largest soil particles suspended in the flood waters get, get deposited closest to the river. And the lighter, smaller soil particles are deposited farther away. After many floods, natural levees form along the riverbank, with soil elevation higher along the riverbank and de decreasing as you may move away from it. Now these are not huge changes in elevation, maybe two to five meters at most. But even small differences in soil elevation around sea level can have big effects on the amount of water in the soil. The soils at higher elevation dr drain toward lower elevations where water accumulates. This gradient in soil water affects plant distribution. Plants that can tolerate lots of soil water, like marsh grasses, grow here. And plants that require drier conditions, like trees, grow on the elevated levee. And this is what, and this is what you see represented on this 210-year-old map. Water is draining away from the Mississippi, perpendicular to the river's natural levee. It's accumulating in these wetlands in the interior of the peninsula and flowing south in these major bios. And the plants are distributed, distributed as you'd expect across the soil moisture gradient with trees on the elevated levees along the Mississippi. Those are those, you can see the trees illustrated there and the, uh, along the levee and the major larger bios, and the wetland grasses in the lower elevation soggy interior. Now those double lines appear to be drainage canals intended for to drain water off of cleared areas for cultivation and habitation. When I first looked at this map, I couldn't figure out what was going on. It looks like the forests were being cleared for development. There were some houses built here and there but I couldn't figure out what those long straight things were. Well, it turns out they're canals, and it actually says so down here. What does it say? Yeah, canal. So these were canals built to drain from this area into the middle, into the central part of the peninsula. And this also points to the importance uh, of rivers, right? So this, the river was the freeway. The river was the airport. The river was the transportation hub. So your most valuable property is facing the river, right? So whereas for us, maybe property was in squares, right? Because that's how people tended to do it. Here, the properties are often rectangular, really long, right? Because the value is you want to have access to the river to, to ship stuff, to receive stuff, and or to be on the driest ground, right? It's counter, a little bit counterintuitive, but you know, we're dry when we're right next to the river. You're actually a lot drier on average than, than anywhere else. So the safest or the, the driest places in New Orleans are right next to the Mississippi River. Kind of yeah. counterintuitive. It is because in the West, we're used to all the r rivers flowing into larger rivers. Right. Small, larger, right. and getting bigger and bigger and flowing into the big ones. But in this case, all the rainwater <laughs> hits the elevated levee and flows this way to the interior. So uh, the canals, these, uh, these same methods that they used uh, back then are still used today to uh, drain and dry the land. This area is Delacro. Above it is suburban development. Wherever water rainfall flows perpendicular to the levees in this direction, 
here you can see how the developers of these properties drug, uh, have dug a series of small canals to drain their properties into the larger canal below. Here's that larger canal. It flows into the golf course. You'll see this. The water flows through the golf course and is pumped into the intercoastal canal here at this massive pumping station that can pump tens of millions of gallons of water a day. So it's sucking from the blue arrows and dumping into the more muddy, or the, the uh, creamer colored water body. Yeah. What this means is that all the water flowing out of the development, which would normally accumulate in the center of the peninsula, is being pumped into the river. Here we are back in 1803. This is 90 years later. This is the US Geological Survey topographical map from 1892. The canals are still present, but it looks like the forest belt has been completely cleared for cultivation. While the, while the forest appears to be gone, the interior marsh, marsh if this illustration is correct, is still present. Now here we are 40 years later, this is another USGS map from 1935, and it looks like the English term marshes are gone. And here's, here's how they did it. They built three serious canals. The Norman Canal, the Donner Canal, and the Planters Canal. One of our collaborators, Katie Braceton, believes that English term was drained for two reasons, agriculture and yellow fever. New Orleans had been plagued by yellow fever and uh, epidemics in the 19th century. And yellow fever is transmitted by Aedes aegypti. Mosquitoes, these mosquitoes require water in their larval stage. And so we think that English churn marsh was drained in part to prevent the scourge of yellow fever. <coughs> in fact, this mosquito is kind of a metaphor for what we did to English churn. <laughs> sucked the marsh dry. <laughs> So in place of a marsh, we now have a forest. It may not be a pristine, naturally occurring forest like the forest White and Skojak surveyed in 2002. It's like a hybrid forest, a Franken forest. Franken forest? That's a registered trademark. <laughs> <laughs> a product of the natural processes of plant dispersal and succession in a hydrologically modified ecosystem. And unless we're willing to backfill the canals and blow up the pumping station, it's never going to be a marsh. But the good news is that it's a beautiful forest that's diverse and supports tons of wildlife and actually does a better job of protecting New Orleans from hurricanes than a marsh does because it holds more water. But despite these important functions, the English turn forests are constantly under threat, most recently from a proposal to build a baseball facility. Because, you know, we all need more baseball facilities. Come on, let's be honest. Without massive intervention, the prognosis for New Orleans at the end of the century, as you guys know, is grim. Saving and growing forests is a cost-effective way to protect New Orleans from the inevitable Category 5 hurricane spinning out of the Gulf of Mexico. Forests are important, especially in New Orleans. We need to preserve as much forest as possible, as fast as possible, and we need to grow more. That is the end. They knew more. <laughs> <laughs>